could give everybody a serviette. Yeah. Thank you. So um, the serviettes you're receiving are dabbed with myrrh. We're looking at myrrh today. So the serviettes have myrrh on them. No, it's, a, it's an interesting smell. Interesting smell. Um, so I don't have a clicker. Do you have a clicker at your end? That would be helpful. <laughs> Thank you. I was up there thinking to myself, how is this going to work? It's going to work brilliantly. This is the scene that we see in nativ nativities uh, up and down the, uh, the nation, people in their homes, as well as uh, in uh, shopping centers. Um, and this is a standard, isn't it? It's a standard of Mary, Joseph, baby in a manger, a shepherd, kings. And the thing that we all know, and I, and I know I'm not bursting any bubbles here, is that's so not what the first Christmas looked like. That's an amalgamation of um, images that we find in the book of, of Matthew, Matthew's Gospel and Luke's Gospel. We bring it all together just to recognize that this is the significance of the nativity, is that a baby was born in poverty, that was visited and honored by the lowest of the low, bringing the shepherds. They were the absolute lowest on the ladder of status in society. So bring the lowest of the low from the hillsides and then bring the highest of the high, the wise men or the three kings or those who uh, reign and rule and have authority and wisdom. So the, the lovely picture that we get with our nativity is that Jesus comes and status is obliterated because he has come for everybody. And these are the words that we have that we're looking at um, over these three Sundays. Next Sunday, we're going to be doing our uh, nativity from scratch. So um, that'll be a little bit of fun. And we'll just spend a few moments reflecting on gold next week. But so we did frankincense last week, recognizing, remembering that Jesus is our high priest. This week, we're looking at, at myrrh. So they uh, saw the star. These are the uh, wise. They were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw the child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and worshipped him. When they'd opened their treasures and presented him with gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh. There's this idea of, of uh, the, the gold being um, the gift that represents uh, purity and, and kingship. There's the frankincense, which is rec representing Jesus as our healer, as our great high priest, the one who stands in the gap. And myrrh, well, the gift of myrrh, this is what we are, are looking at today, is um, recognized to symbolize the fact that Jesus was to die. So everything that the wise brought to Jesus had a prophetic uh, message. King of kings. He was the great high priest. And he was the one who was going to die. And it's like, isn't it? I mean, yesterday, you know, in the afternoon, there could have been predictions going around. How was England going to do? in their match against France. Some said they were going to uh, scrape by. Others said it will go to penalties. Others said France will absolutely obliterate them. Well, they didn't get obliterated, but they certainly got beaten. But if you'd have gone back a week or, or a month or, or a year and been able to predict what the result of the match last night was. This is prophetic. And I mean, you know, people put 
uh, money on these things. What's so brilliant, I love about what's happening with us here, is that we read of these prophetic gifts which are speaking out to the world of everything that we need. And everything we need is a savior, the one who is the king of kings and is the Lord of lords, the one who is the great high priest, the one who is willing to give of himself. So as these kings come and these magi, these wise men, and they lay these gifts before Jesus, there's the prophetic edge that's coming to the fore saying that this child is going to be the answer for all of mankind. But myrrh, myrrh focuses on Jesus' death. Myrrh, I mean, think to ourselves, you know, how does this represent the sacrifice that Jesus gave? And, and the first sort of element that you look at or, or you recognize with, the, with myrrh, and we've even just sung it with the three kings uh, carol that we've just sung, it just picks up on the bitterness and the pain. If we start with the myrrh, the word uh, myrrh comes from a Hebrew word, uh, mara, M-A-R-A, mara, which means bitter. You may remember in the Old Testament story of Ruth. Um, she's lost her husband and her two sons. She returns home to her friends and she says this. She says, don't call me Naomi. This is in the book of Ruth. She told them, call me Mara, because the Almighty has made my life very bitter. Myrrh, Mara, bitter. Hebrew society, someone's name often reflected um, who they were. I, I mean, it's, you may have the same with you. I remember my name is David, and the name David means beloved. There you go. And all of your names have a, a meaning. And Hebrew is very important to recognize that names had meanings. You didn't just throw a name out. It was important that the name stood for something. And uh, often there was a, a gathering together of, of words that emphasized something significant. And this word mara or bitter is a word that carries through again and again and again in Scripture. Whenever something happened in a place, something was named after the activity and it pulled down on its uh, original meaning. This is uh, one of the scriptures that picks up on this bitterness. Moses led the Israelites away from the Red Sea into the desert of Shur. They traveled for three days in the desert but found no water. When they came to Mara, now there we go, we've got the base Mara. The same base that we have for Myrrh. And they came to this uh, place, Mara, where there was water. But guess what the water was like? It was bitter. It was nasty. Named because of its attributes, it's clear to see that that's not the place to be going to get your fresh water. They came to this place that was bitter. Everybody knew it was bitter. But then again, all you've got to look at is the type of tree that the resin that makes myrrh comes from. And this sort of tree just somehow looks sort of gnarly and nasty. I don't know, I mean, I'm, I'm not a great uh, tree lover myself, but I'm thinking to myself, if I had a tree in my garden, I probably wouldn't have a myrrh tree. It just looks bitter, unpleasant. It's not the sort of thing that you're going to get your uh, maple syrup type stuff from. So it's got pain, it's got bitterness, it's got 
this look about it of, of suffering, yet the resin, the myrrh that comes from such a tree, was actually used as an antiseptic or a preservative. Something so uh, ugly, something so bitter in its root, is something that is meant to relieve pain. We know this from these words from uh, Mark's Gospel. This is where Jesus is uh, heading towards uh, his crucifixion on Golgotha. And the soldiers brought Jesus to that place, the place of the skull. And they offered him there a mild painkiller, which was wine mixed with myrrh. But he wouldn't take it. And they nailed him to the cross. So this bitter substance is also a, a reliever of pain. Yet Jesus recognized that upon that cross, he was taking the pain of the whole world and didn't want any, uh, anything that was going to take away the enormity of what he was doing for us upon that cross. There was no anesthetic needed. He was willing to bear our pain completely. So there's bitterness is part of the understanding of, of myrrh. And it pulls out on the, the whole focus of, of the pain that Jesus was willing to bear for you and I. And that pain leads to de death. And, and I'm thinking to myself, this is a cracking Christmas message, isn't it? <laughs> so bitterness, agony, pain, death. Well, death is what we pick up on in John's Gospel, where we find myrrh used again. Afterward, Joseph of Arimathea, who had been a secret disciple of Jesus because he feared the Jewish leaders, asked Pilate for permission to take down Jesus' body. Then Pilate gave permission. Joseph came and took the body away. With him came Nicodemus, the man who had come to Jesus at night. He brought 75 pounds of perfumed ointment made with myrrh and aloes, Following Jewish burial custom, they wrapped Jesus' body in the spices in long sheets of linen cloth. So at the end of Jesus' life, he, his body was encased in myrrh. And it's really interesting, isn't it? That, and I don't think there's any um, doubt at all that when the wise men, when the gifts of the Magi were brought, they carried that uh, heavy prophetic edge that uh, for a baby born to receive myrrh was a recognition that that baby was going to die and that baby was going to die such a significant death. It's just mind-blowing. Myrrh. It cleans, it anesthetizes, but it also recognizes pain and bitterness and death. Myrrh. Just have a whiff of your myrrh. Pain, bitterness, death. It's not the sort of thing you're going to put behind your ears, is it, really? Going out on a date. It also, there's a, a recognition that it uh, represents longevity or, 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 or eternity. Myrrh has this uh, special ability to hang around. So if you get it on yourself, there is a good chance you'll be smelling it for a long, long time. Um, some of the... Uh, archaeologists who found alabaster jars in the uh, excavation of the pyramids have found them with uh, myrrh inside. And when they cracked open the vase, the scent is still there. 
thousands of years later. And there's that um, sense, again, in the anointing of Jesus' body, that what they were saying was, this, this body will be preserved, but what he has done will continue on way into the future. These words from the book of Revelation. Then the seventh angel blew this trumpet and there were loud voices shouted in heaven. The world has now become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ and he will reign forever and ever. And I suppose this is where we're getting to the crux of the Christmas story. That which happened in a manger 2,000 years ago is still impacting the world today. It wasn't a fly-by-night encounter. It was the touch point of the heavenly with the earthly, with humanity and the divine that was changing mankind forever and ever. The key on the long-lasting element of myrrh is the fact that the one who received that gift is the one who will never let you down. He is always for you. He is always with you. But there's one more thing that I want to talk about. And that's the story of Esther. So we've recognized that there is bitterness in myrrh. There is pain in myrrh. There is also this uh, whole umbrella of death. As well as the uh, aneth the tizing type of element and the, the medical side of things it's always very dark and then we have the story of Esther in the Old Testament you may remember this story um, Queen Esther Israel let me just give you a really potted uh, history here it's going to be very quick Israel is conquered by Persia King Xerxes um, has a problem with his wife, uh, Queen Vishti, and she is kicked off of the throne. Um, he looks for a new wife. Many girls come forward to try out for the position. Esther is chosen. Esther's uncle finds out about a plot to kill all of the Jews. He tells Esther. She convinces the king not to do it and saves the Jewish people. That's it in a nutshell. There's a celebration for the Jews um, recognizing all that Esther did. And uh, Purim, P-U-R-I-M, -P Purim, happens in March. Usually every year. Well, it's in March around. It's one of those movable feasts like Easter. It jumps up and down. But the significance of what Esther did is remembered every year. But this is where it gets interesting. Esther is chosen as one of the girls who can be the king's wife, or could be the king's wife. So she had to prepare to meet the king. How long do you think the preparation to meet the king would last? How long? Let me read to you from Esther chapter 12, uh, 2, verse 12. Before a girl's turn came to go to, into King Xerxes, she had to complete 12 months of beauty treatments prescribed for the women, six months with the oil of myrrh and six months with perfumes and cosmetics before she could go to see the king she had to prepare herself for a year six months with myrrh six months 
with perfumes and cosmetics. Myrrh made her ready to meet the king. Just have a sniff of your napkin. Myrrh made her ready to meet the king. Myrrh makes us ready to meet the king. As you smell, as it's on your hands, if you've been holding the napkin, it's on you. What I find absolutely mind-blowing is that Jesus, who is the King of Kings, has made us ready to meet his heavenly Father. He did it all. There was no going away for us and spending significant amounts of time in preparation. That smell of that myrrh that's on your hands and up your noses now is a reminder of the fact that Jesus did it. He did it all. He, 33 years upon this earth, living the perfect life, died the most horrific death so that you and I can be reconciled with our Heavenly Father. The nativity scene is all about what's happening in the future. God became flesh and dwelt among us that we, flesh, may be able to dwell for eternity with God. And that myrrh, the bitterness, the pain, the death, we have not had to carry because Jesus carried it all. He bore it all because of his amazing love for you and for me. Myrrh. Not the greatest smell, and as I say, you will carry that with you if you've been holding one of those cloths, but an amazing reminder of the fact that the love of God, the love of God is so intense, so long-lasting, so poignant, and so personal. So as you hold that, you can recognize how much Jesus loves you. How much Jesus loves you. A gift given to him at his birth. A gift used to wrap him in his death. A gift that speaks of preparation for an encounter with our Heavenly Father. All for us. Completely free. So we come to Advent and recognize that this on the third Sunday of Advent is a day we think of love. And how awesome that the third Sunday in Advent and love marry in with that gift of myrrh, which says so clearly, I love you. I love you. Have a sniff of your napkin. Allow that aroma just to get up your nose, on your hands. And as you go from here today, be really aware how loved you are. How loved you are. Let me pray. Bitterness and pain, death, eternity, preparation to meet the King, all in a fragrance 
from a rather ugly tree. Yet, we are a mindful Lord today that it represents something astonishing about your character, of how you love us. So our prayer, Lord, as we go from this place today, is that the love that you have for us will draw us deeper into a relationship with you that would overflow in an aroma of love to the world around us. May we be a signpost that directs people to you this Advent season. In Jesus' name, amen.